Hello and welcome to the lecture on ventilator graphics. So this one can be a little involved. The big thing here is sort of looking at the different graphics under different conditions. And so we'll practice some of these in lab. Uh, we'll try to make a chart too. Uh, no guarantees on that one, but we'll try to make a chart that should help clarify things. Graphics overall are going to be very, very useful when it comes down to seeing how the patient is interacting with the ventilator. Uh, if we need to modify any settings, uh, sometimes even it lets us know about mode changes. It can tell us about compliance and resistance. Uh, it can tell us about air trapping. It can tell us about uh, the, uh, the settings being sensitive enough or not being uh, too sensitive or sensitive enough. Uh, so it can give us a lot of very valuable information, especially when one of the goals of mechanical ventilation is to reduce worker breathing or to help let the muscles and the respiratory muscles recover. So when we're looking at this, the graphics are a great visual representation, especially if you're a person that likes pictures, right? You're more of a visual person that likes pictures over figuring out, hey, their numbers are going this direction or that direction, and you like to see the pictures, right? This is gonna be for you then. Ventilator graphics are very useful too. And ventilator graphics didn't used to be uh, a big thing. It used to be like a little bar that would move. I remember the 7200 was one of my first ventilators that Medtronics makes. Uh, and it was just, uh, it didn't have a graphics package to begin with, right? It used to not have a little graphics screen. And so all you had was a little bar on the side that would move up and down with breath delivery, tell you how much pressure it took, right? So uh, get used to these. There's a lot of different graphics out there. This is just an introduction to the graphics. And so we'll get into it and hopefully just spend some time, especially in the lab with doing high resistance lungs and seeing what happens to your graphics. Uh, introducing the leak and see what happens with your graphics. Uh, doing low compliance, see what happens with your graphics. Doing high compliance, see what happens with your graphics, right? Try to simulate different situations and observe what happens to your graphics. That's gonna be the most helpful thing, getting your hands dirty, right? Getting your hands on a ventilator and seeing it under different conditions, how the graphics change. What does it look like when a patient's air hungry and <gasps> sucking it in, right? And so try to introduce that when you're practicing as well. So those things will be very, very helpful when you're trying to understand what it looks like on a real person. So even from outside the room, uh, then you can see, oh yeah, it looks like there's water in the circuit because you can see the oscillations on there, right? So it's going to help you with your assessment of that patient ventilator interaction. And the patient ventilator interaction is very important if we want to help that patient recover optimally. So let's get into it. So ventilator graphics are incorporated to allow real-time measurements of the patient ventilator interaction. So we can see real-time what's going on instead of just static measurements at time to time to time. So I can see as I'm in the room, as I'm at that bedside, as I'm looking at that monitor, what is the patient doing with this machine? It does give us insight into the mechanics of the breathing, right, during the mechanical ventilation. So that way I can see what's happening with their compliance and resistance. We use it to monitor uh, the patient and see how they're doing because it gives us feedback uh, on how much volume is getting into the lungs if they're on pressure ventilation or how much pressure it takes to deliver that volume if they're in volume ventilation. Uh, it tells us about the ventilator function. Is there a leak in the circuit? Is there water in the circuit, right? Is it not sensitive enough? Is it too sensitive, right? And then we can see the response to the patient's response to the ventilator. Is it appropriate when they're interacting with each other between the patient and the ventilator? Like I said, the ideal situation is to have perfect synchrony. That may not be doable, but uh, the idea here is to do everything you can to reduce any risk of trauma, uh, including the patient working against the machine and making them have a prolonged stay in the ICU or even on mechanical ventilation. So graphics, they really do help you uh, adjust the ventilator settings. So that's going to be something that we like to look at too, is what is our ventilator settings doing with this information, right? So I can see if there's over distension, if their tidal volume is too big. Uh, I can see if there's patient effort, they're trying to exhale, is the ventilator still delivering the breath, or they're trying to inhale and the ventilator's not giving them a breath. Right? So it helps us adjust different settings like sensitivity, uh, inspiratory pause, rate, tidal volume, so on and so forth. It can help us evaluate how appropriate 
our patient is with the settings that we have there. So we're going to have our initial settings that we'll put the patient on, and then we need to monitor how they interact with it. Well, the graphics are going to be one of your best tools in your toolbox to do this, right? So that's going to be very, very useful. So it does take time and practice to master the skill. Uh, just like a cardiologist with looking at EKGs, it takes time. You have to see these patterns, right? Pattern recognition is going to be your best friend when you're looking at this. So when we're looking at patterns, right, try to get that down. This is where I strongly recommend making a ventilator graphic chart. Uh, and we can try to do that in class as well. But that's going to help you. And like I said, in lab, when we're in there with the ventilators, try to induce an air leak. Try to induce work of breathing. Try to induce low compliance. Try to do high resistance. Try to do high compliance. Those things are going to help you big time. Uh, so when you are out there, you have much better pattern recognition, right? So that's the name of the game is pattern recognition. You may not get it right out the gate, but we'll try the best we can. And like I said, the big thing is keep working on developing this skill. It will come with time and practice. Just like any other skill, the time and practice is going to be your biggest help here. So take your time, do some practice. If you make flashcards, if you whatever it is, it will help you in the long run. It makes it a lot easier when we can see those things. Graphics can greatly enhance our ability to assess uh, the patient, not only what's going on with their lungs and compliance and resistance, chest wall, uh, what's going on with their airways, whether it's an ET tube or trach, but it also will help us improve care because we can see it much faster than doing a bunch of different procedures like chest x-rays and uh, EMGs or anything like that. Like we can see that going on a lot faster and a lot easier. So it might really be something that you could make a patient way more comfortable on that ventilator and reduce the amount of sedation. And then might that reduce sedation level might help their cognition after they're off the ventilator. Right, so these things do have a trickle effect. So make sure we're doing everything we can to be a master in our craft. And mastering graphics is going to be a huge feather in your cap, right? So you you see this, you see these graphics, and they can really alert you to any abnormalities even before the signs are obvious, right? So you can see that their resistance is going up. You can see that their compliance is going down. You can see that they have that respiratory distress. You can see it's not sensitive enough for them, right? You can see that before that patient gets into severe distress. So the earlier we catch it, the better, right? And that that's hopefully going to allow for less days on the ventilator or less trauma to that patient later on. All right, so let's start. These are your basic ones. Now, there's more graphics than these, and you're like, Derek, I can't take this anymore. I get it, but let's just start with these, right? There's two terms that I want you to look at here. There's scalars and loops, scalars and loops. So we'll just start with these. Uh, and then there's always advanced mechanical ventilation, but scalars and loops. Scalar is anything compared to time, right? Anything compared to time. That's this first bullet point here. Anything compared to time. So a pressure time scalar, that's this one right here, right? Pressure's on the x-axis. Uh, uh, sorry, time's on the x-axis. Pressure's on the y or the vertical axis. Uh, there's your flow time scalar, which is this next one down here. Uh, time is on the x-axis and then vertically flow so inspiratory flow rate is up here expiratory flow rate is down here right and then finally you have your volume time scalar uh, time is the x-axis or the the horizontal and then uh, the volume is going to be your vertical y-axis right right here so those are going to be your three primary scalars scalar means it's compared to time, right? So volume to compared to time, flow compared to time, uh, uh, pressure compared to time, right? So those are your basic scalars. Loops are different. They compare two different variables that are not time traditionally. So the two big ones that we'll look at here are the pressure volume loop, one of my personal favorites. So you're going to hear me talk about that quite a bit. And then finally, your flow volume loop. So pressure volume and flow volume loop. The flow volume loop should sound familiar from pulmonary function, where we have the patient take a deep breath in and do a forced vital capacity. <gasps> 
right? We have them blow out as far as hard as they can, and right until they're all the way out, and then take a deep breath in. So we can look at inspiratory flow rate and expiratory flow rate. Right, and then we could see volume is on this x-axis, right? The horizontal, and then the flow rate is the vertical. So this would be inspiratory flow rate, and this would be expiratory flow rate on the bottom there. So it is upside down from a PFT one. I know. Did I come up with this? No. Do I have to break the news to you about it? Yes. Right. So when you're looking at a flow volume loop, it is the same loop that we see with pulmonary function testing. However, uh, it's upside down. Right, I can't control that, right? That's beyond my realm, but there you go. So let's start with basic shapes. Um, so a square waveform usually represents constant, constant parameter, right? So here you see a basic square and a ramp waveform that you're looking at here. Uh, the ramp uh, represents a variable parameter. In other words, the flow rate can vary throughout the breath delivery. Uh, it will vary with changes in lung characteristics, right? So uh, the flow rate can increase or decrease depending on what's happening with that. And then most common uh, with your ramp waveform is going to be the decelerating ramp. So this one's an accelerating ramp, but the decelerating one is gonna be the most common one that you see there. Uh, so the decelerating ramp uh, is something you can select in volume control ventilation and it's something that's naturally uh, that waveform is naturally selected in pressure control. That's what how it delivers that breath. But the square waveform uh, which is a selection you can make in volume ventilation is a constant flow rate and you'll see that right it looks like a square waveform right uh, and you can select that in volume ventilation. Now I do encourage you when you're playing with the ventilators uh, to change it between uh, a square and a ramp and see what happens to your inspiratory time, right? Does your inspiratory time change when you switch between a square and a ramp? And the answer is yes. But my subsequent question is which one has a shorter inspiratory time, the square or the ramp? The other thing to look at is what happens to your mean airway pressure and your peak airway pressure when you switch between a a square in a ramp. So make those observations, write this down somewhere, right? Write in your notes. Make observations what happens between a square and a ramp when I switch between those two with high pressure, mean airway pressure, and inspiratory time, right? So there is a difference there and you do want to know why it's adv advantageous for certain patient populations. If someone needs a long expiratory time, then maybe the one that has a shorter eye time might be beneficial. Maybe if someone needs more mean airway pressure and lower peak airway pressures, maybe the other one is more beneficial, right? So it does behoove you to look at this and to make sure that you understand what's going on. Be a master at your craft. All right, so graphics when we're looking at these. Time triggered, constant flow, and volume targeted here. And then we have time triggered, descending flow and volume targeted ventilation. So this is showing you the difference in the graphics between one versus the other. So I'll just draw a dividing line here. So time triggered constant flow, right? So this is going to mean that it's a square waveform. And do you not see this on the square waveform, right? Do you see how it's square on the inspiratory portion right there? See that square? Now over here, right, if we're doing a little compare and contrast, which is the whole point of the slide, right? Over here we see the decelerating ramp, right? Do you see that? Do you not see it decelerating down, right? So then you can look at the graphic and automatically know, hey, they're in a ramp, right? Or, hey, they're in a square waveform. Hey, their inspiratory time might not be long enough for them in that square, let's switch them to a ramp, right? So this is something that's going to help you not only identify uh, the patient interaction, but also what settings you have uh, if, you, if you don't see it right on the vent screen to begin with. This next one, that was the flow scaler. This next one is the pressure scalers that you're looking at here. So both of these are time triggered. That means the patient's not triggering these breaths at all. Um, but the only difference here is that we have a different waveform. Do you not see that this one causes higher pressures? Do you see that it causes higher pressures? Look at these spikes here, right? Then when you look over at the decelerating ramp, Look at these pressures, a lot lower pressure, right? We have a lot lower pressure, 
but we have a longer inspiratory times, which means our mean airway pressure is going to be big. Mean airway pressure is the amount of pressure over this whole thing, right? So there's a lot more volume, a lot more mean airway pressure in here than there is in just this little short inspiratory time over here, right? Really short inspiratory time <gasps> versus, <gasps> right? Longer eye time lower pressures but higher mean airway pressures right uh, and then you can see your volume scalar at the very bottom right you can see how a short inspiratory time it's still the same volume delivery but that inspiratory time changes just between selecting a square versus a ramp so that's an advantage there there you can see this is a graphical representation of what happens when you select a descending ramp versus a square and so you can see patients that have high peak airway pressures maybe they would, might have an advantage switching them over to a decelerating ramp give it a try right make sure it's the appropriate patient for it um, but understand their mean airway pressures could go up so could that cause other effects like higher intracranial pressures higher thoracic pressures which could impede the vena cava yeah absolutely but if you have someone that has a COPD emphysema atelectasis maybe a longer eye time and higher mean airway pressure but lower peak airway pressure might be more advantageous right so that's where we see pluses and minuses just with selecting between a square and a ramp waveform all right, pressure versus volume. This one's a little dated, but I'll give you a quick thing. This even includes um, pressure regulated volume control uh, as well. So when we're looking at volume modes, uh, here we have an ascending ramp, right? Uh, with our pressure waveform. And then here in PRVC, we have a square ramp uh, or square delivery, right? So the pressure is a constant pressure. We're delivering a constant pressure over a certain specific inspiratory time in both PRVC and regular pressure control, right? In both regular pressure control. So this one is be PRVC and this one would be regular pressure control. So when we're looking at this, that's gonna help us see what's going on there. So when we're looking at the flow waveform, in volume ventilation, I know this sounds a little backwards, in volume ventilation, traditionally it was a square only for the flow delivery or the breath delivery. Uh, so what we do nowadays have this option in volume ventilation in most ventilators of switching it to decelerating ramp in volume ventilation. So there's good news, right? There's good news. However, uh, traditionally in pressure control, it was a variable flow rate, variable flow rate. And that's why in your book talks about this as well, that variable flow rate might be more comfortable for certain patient populations. If they're especially air hungry, <laughs> they're really trying to pull that in. Instead of controlling that flow rate uh, in volume ventilation, we can give them a, a, a pressure control that allows them to pull their own flow rate and if that's not enough then we can increase uh, the amount of flow given to them by increasing peak pressure uh, in that pressure control if it's still not enough and the bottom one you see is your volume scalar right the bottom is the volume scalar down here uh, and then you're going to see it's very stable uh, in these modes when we're looking at it. So it's not going to be affected too much, but you do see more mean airway pressure, right? So you do see that as an as a, a side, side that happens here. All right, so basic waveforms. In volume modes, the shape of the pressure waveform will be a ramp for mandatory breaths. In pressure modes, the shape of the pressure waveform will be a square shape, right? right when we're looking at this this means that the pressure is constant during inspiration or it's a set parameter so you see here uh, let me switch to uh, let's do light green here there we go you see here we set a pressure let's say it's 20 so we're setting a pressure of 20 and an inspiratory time of one second right <gasps> right it's that same pressure for a total of one second right for one second. So it's that same pressure for one second. So that's why it looks like that. It's saying I'm giving this amount of pressure for this time period. However, in volume modes, it's saying, hey, I'm delivering this volume. I'm ramping up until the, all that volume is delivered, right? Till I reach my 500 mLs or whatever we have that set for. So that's really gonna help us out overall, uh, seeing, okay, this is a pressure controlled mode versus a volume controlled mode, right? 
So when we're looking at this, we can use these graphics to represent air trapping, uh, to look at air trapping, to look at airway obstruction. We can look for bronchodilator response. We can look for respiratory mechanics. Uh, we can see if a patient's actively exhaling, they're forcing the breath out against the machine. That's not a good thing usually. Breath type, we can see if they're in pressure or volume ventilation. We can look at their peak airway pressures. We can look at their plateau airway pressures when we do an inspiratory pause maneuver. We can look at what CPAP level or intrinsic PEEP they have as well, uh, especially if we can't get a good measurement uh, if the patient's actively breathing over it. We can see if there's asynchrony and then how we're going to work on that asynchrony, if it's asynchrony during inspiration versus exhalation. Uh, and then we can see what their triggering effort is, is if it's enough. So let's look at the pressure scaler here, right? So here I want to point out the baseline waveform will be higher when PEEP is present, right? Uh, so this is showing with PEEP, a PEEP of 5. Here I'm circling PEEP of 5, right? So that's just showing you that that baseline is telling you what their baseline is. Their baseline right now is a PEEP of 5. So if I have the vent set at a peep of zero, right, uh, zeep, if you will, and i looking at the graphic and I see a peep of five, there is intrinsic peep going on. There is uh, uh, air trapping, if you will, that's going on. So it can help me see that by looking at that pressure scalar. So uh, it will tell me what's going on when there's higher PEEP. The baseline for the waveform will be higher when PEEP is present, right? So this is that baseline. So here, right here where I circled it, see how this baseline is a little bit higher than this baseline over here at the beginning, right? Compare these two. This one's on the line. This one over here is the above the line. Do you see that, All right? Do you not see that? So it's just showing you uh, that there's air trapping, right? If we see it above that baseline. So here it's set at five and then it's above five when we get over here, right? It's above five when we get over here. So that's showing that there is some air trapping. There is some peep that's going on. That's not what we were send, uh, intending that patient to have. Uh, if there's a negative deflection just before the waveform, that usually means that there's a negative pressure breath that's been generated. In other words, there's patient effort. And that's what we see here in the middle. That's that patient effort. So that patient effort, if you see that negative deflection, that means the patient triggered that breath. If you look over here, there's no patient effort because there's no negative deflection. Or if there is patient effort that you can visually see, but you don't see it on the graphics, that means your ventilator's not sensitive enough to pick that up. So you actually might have to change your sensitivity setting to make it more sensitive to that patient so that way it can trigger. But here you see the difference between a patient trigger and a time triggered, right? So this one over here would be time triggered. This one over here would be patient triggered, right? So that tells you the time triggered versus patient triggered. So you'll see that negative deflection that negative deflection is a hint the patient triggered or initiated that breath. Pressure scalar, uh, the area under the entire curve represents mean airway pressure. And mean airway pressure is very important when we're talking about hemodynamics, uh, when we're talking about uh, head pressures, like intracranial pressures, cerebral perfusion pressures. Uh, it's very important when we're even talking about things like atelectasis and slow lung recruitment. Uh, so it's gonna come in very handy understanding what all goes into mean airway pressure, but it's everything in there from the beginning of the inspiration to the beginning of the expiration until they finally reach back down at baseline again. So it's everything in there represents mean airway pressure. So your peak airway pressure, your plateau pressures, your airway resistance makes it longer for you to inhale and longer for you to exhale especially. Uh, and then even things like your alveolar distending pressure, which would be your plateau pressure, right? So peak inspiratory pressure usually represents dynamic compliance, but also can be representing of resistance uh, and uh, static compliance as well. Plateau pressure uh, and alveolar distending pressure, usually synonymous, right? So plateau pressure is number two here. Let me circle it here. So your peak airway pressure is number one on the waveform. Plateau airway, 
plateau pressure, sorry, is number two that you use an inspiratory pause for. Uh, letter A represents airway resistance. When we're looking at airway resistance, how much it actually takes to deliver that breath. So your difference between your PIP and your PLAT over your flow rate in liters per second is the calculation for raw. PIP minus PLAT over flow rate in liters per second is your raw. And that's what it's showing here. It's the gradient between our PIP and PLAT between one and two. And then we're just gonna divide it by our flow rate in liters per second. And that tells you their error resistance. Uh, letter B down there, that's the alveolar distending pressure. And that's what we get from the plateau. When we do an inspiratory pause on the machine, it's telling us a plateau pressure. It's saying without any air moving, we're stopping exhalation. And then we're going to see what the back pressure is from there. So we're actually looking at elastins, right? We're seeing how much elasticity there is, how much back pressure there is. And with that elastins, uh, what's going on with their compliance? Because remember, they're inverse of each other. So therefore, the higher the plateau pressure, the higher the plateau, the lower the compliance. The higher the plateau, the lower the compliance, right? So that's what we're seeing. So the high plateau tells me there's high elastance, which means there's low compliance. High elastance means low compliance. So high plateau pressures means low compliance issues. So when we're looking at this, uh, this is a compare and contrast slide. So when we're looking at letter A here, letter A is showing an increase in airway resistance. What's happening with our trans airway pressure? Uh, so that's the gradient between PIP and PLAT. So that as that gradient increases, right, do you see this increase in that gradient? That's showing that we're having an increase in air resistance. But if the plateau moves with it, and that's what we see in letter B here, letter B here, uh, then that's a sign that it's just our compliance that caused the whole thing to change. So I like to equate this, and you might have heard me say this in class before. Uh, if your pips go up and your plats stay home, then that's a raw relationship, right? If one, per one partner is going out to do their own thing, the other one's staying at home, that's pretty raw. Right, it's a raw deal, right? They're not very compliant with each other. But if both of them go together, they both dress up in their same windbreakers, right? They both go to the same store together. They both play tennis together. They ride their tandem bicycle together. Then that is a very compliant relationship and they like to go together. So if they go together and they both increase, my pips and my plat both go up then that's a change in compliance for the worse, right? That means our compliance got worse. Uh, if our PIP and plateau both decrease together, then that means our compliance improved, right? We have stretchier lungs, if you will, right? So this is a compare and contrast between compliance and airway resistance issues. And we've probably worked on this in class before. Uh, so that's one of the things that you'll look at there. What's my trans airway pressure? Is my the gradient between my PIP and PLAT increasing versus, so this would be my gradient versus my PIP and PLAT increasing versus both of these moving together, right? If they move together, it's a compliance issue. If they separate, then it's a raw relationship. If they move together, it's a compliance issue. If they separate, it's a raw relationship. All right, so let's talk about an expiratory pause maneuver. Well, hey, why would I do an expiratory pause maneuver? Well, if I'm looking for intrinsic peep, sneaky peep, occult peep, right? There's a bunch of different terms for it that are out there, uh, air trapping, if you will. Uh, while performing an expiratory pause, if there is trapped gas, it will cause the waveform to go above the baseline. So here you see the baseline, right? You see the baseline. And here you see the expiratory hold is at that baseline. But what happens to that waveform, right? It goes up, right? It goes up. So our, our set level is five, but our total level is nine, right? So that's showing you that, hey, this person has a lot of extra pressure left over at the end of that breath delivery. So that's a sign that if it's significant enough, we need to treat. So um, currently the acceptable amount of auto peep should be under five, right? So if they're auto peeping more than five, then that could be very, very significant. But if they're only auto peeping one or two centimeters of water pressure, not very significant. Uh, but to each patient, 
situations might change. So just be aware of that, but understand five is the magical number of it being significant or insignificant uh, in your adult patient population. All right, so what are we seeing here? We have an increase in airway resistance, right? So we have an increase between our peak airway pressure, and I'm just gonna write PIP, versus our plateau. So here you see a, de uh, a change where the plateau pressure is pretty low, right? The plateau pressure is here, but all of a sudden our pips start going up. So you go into the room, high pressure alarm sounding, high pressure alarm sounding, high pressure alarm sounding. So you go into the room and you do an inspiratory pause maneuver, right? Do an inspiratory pause. Plateau pressure is the same where it was last time you were in the room. So what does that mean? This means there's an airway resistance issue. Is the patient biting on the tube? Are you able to pass the suction catheter? Is there secretions plugging off the tube? Uh, if it's a tracheostomy tube, are there secretions? Do you need to change out the inner cannula or something like that going on? Is the cuff herniated over the end of the tube, whether it's a trach or an ET tube? Uh, is there something like that that's causing that raw? Do they have a bronchospasm? Listen to their lungs, right? Is there wheezing, significant wheezing going on? So that's what we're looking at here is a raw relationship because the plateau stayed the same the other one went off and did its own thing so it's a very raw relationship let's talk about the volume scalar all right so the volume waveform uh, will have a mountain peak appearance at the top right you'll see both of these look like little mountains uh, there will also be a plateau if an inspiratory pause is set or an inspiratory hold maneuver. So inspiratory hold maneuver is when we're trying to get a plateau measurement and looking at elastins, but telling us about compliance, right? We've already talked about that. But if we can also, if we have a patient who has a very short inspiratory time, let's say they're in a square waveform, but we want to increase the length of their inspiratory time, then we can institute an inspiratory hold with each breath right, depending on the ventilator and the machine. So that's one of those things that we can do that really helps with, with gas distribution in the lungs is adding that inspiratory pause. Or like what we talked about, the decelerating waveform, that will increase the mean airway pressure, which helps with gas distribution or ventilation distribution as well. So this is showing what it would look like if there's an inspiratory pause with each breath. Right, and I encourage you when you're in the lab and playing with the ventilators, write this down on things I want to try on the ventilator, right? Go ahead and do this. Do it without a pause, right? And then go ahead and do an inspiratory pause maneuver, see what it looks like. And then set it where there's an inspiratory pause automatically with each breath. So that way you see the difference in these graphics and waveforms. All right, one of the cool things about the volume scaler, it can be used to uh, look at error trapping. If it's above baseline, then that's trapped volume that they did not, right? Uh, if the exhale volume does not return to baseline, that means that that's trapped gas. If there's leak where it doesn't return back to baseline, right, at all, uh, it, you can see how much tidal volume has been delivered, especially in pressure controlled ventilation. That's going to be a very helpful scaler to you. So you can see that and evaluate that right away. Uh, you can see if the patient's actively exhaling, blowing against the ventilator too, which is very important because then you don't want them expending too much energy while they're on the ventilator, especially respiratory muscle energy. Not only that, but what's it doing to their mentation if they're trying to force against a machine that where a tube's stuck in their throat? That could be creating anxiety and a lot of mental distress as well, emotional and mental distress. Is that something you want to add to this patient? No, I want to make them as comfortable as possible on that machine. So that's where I got to come in. So that's something you can see too, and that would be a negative deflection on there or possibly a, a positive deflection depending on what's going on. So any type of asynchrony, volume, you could see that easily in volume. All right, so what does it look like when there's a loss of volume, when the air drops off, right? And do you not see this? Do you not see how it just drops off here, right? Here I am circling it on the screen if you're just listening, but uh, it's a graphics presentation, so it's probably good to watch too if you're not watching. Uh, but if the exhalation side of the waveform doesn't return to baseline, it could be from either air trapping or a leak in the ET tube cuff or a circuit or a chest tube, something like that's going on. So that's where you got to start your troubleshooting. If you don't see it returning back to baseline, which one of these is most likely it, right? So that's going to be very helpful to you. Hey, are they getting all their volume? Are they exhaling all their volume in there, right? Or are they getting their, is there a leak in the circuit? Did someone leave this, the, the port on the Ballard open? Anything like that could potentially cause this type of waveform. 
and your flow scaler. So flow scalers uh, will change depending on what flow rate you have set. So in volume mode, we'll just talk about the pressure uh, with the square waveform real quick. In the volume mode, if you have a, a square waveform or constant waveform, uh, the shape will be square. That's if you have that selected. Now, do you understand modern ventilators allow you to do decelerating ramp in volume, but uh, this means that the flow remains constant as a set parameter. Uh, so you're gonna see it the same the whole time. But in pressure mode, and that's why some people can really be more comfortable looking when we switch them over to pressure, control is it's a variable flow rate, right? Uh, the shape of the flow waveform will have a ramp pattern. It looks like a decaying ramp there. I always thought it looked like Texas but that's just me. I don't know. Maybe I'm insulting Texas. I don't know. I'm not intending to, so I'm not, no one insult there, but it, see how it looks like. Anyway, moving on. Uh, when we're doing that, that's showing you, okay, I'm going to have that initial pressure setting and it's just going to hold that pressure for that certain length of time, like at one second inspiratory time, right? And then it'll cycle into exhalation, which is below. So inhalation is above, right? We talked about this before and exhalation is below. So I can see what their inspiratory flow rate is, as well as their expiratory flow rate, and including their peak expiratory flow rate, especially helpful in your obstructive disease patients. So this scaler, the, the flow scaler, can really be helpful with air trapping. I like this one for air trapping a lot. Uh, airway obstructions, uh, how they respond to bronchodilators. We can see a change in their peak expiratory flow rate. We can see a change in their expiratory time constant, which would hopefully improve. Uh, we can see if they're actively exhaling. We can actually see uh, if they're in pressure versus volume ventilation, if it's square in volume ventilation. We can see what their inspiratory flow rate is if they're, they're air hungry still. If they're still air hungry and they're in pressure ventilation, then we might need to increase our peak airway pressure. We might need to increase the pressure gradient, right, to help with that air hunger. Uh, and then in uh, any asynchrony, especially if they're air hungry still, you'd see a negative deflection in there. And I think I have pictures of that in here as well. And then even with triggering effort, you can see that in your flow scaler. So is flow scaler pretty important? I think so. I like the flow scaler quite a bit. Not as much as the PV loop, but we all have our own little things. All right, so here's just doing a compare and contrast between a square waveform and a decelerating ramp. So just in general, right, the, just the general things. Uh, this this uh, in volume ventilation with a square waveform here, you see that flow is going to be constant. I set a flow rate of 60 liters per minute. It's constant, 60 liters per minute. Right, it's just grow, going. Uh, 70 liters per minute, 75 liters per minute, 30, 40 liters per minute. Right, it's just constant. Right, and so that's why it looks like that square pattern. Now, in pressure, right here it looks like decelerating. I'm going to set a pressure. It's going to deliver the pressure and hold it for whatever my I time is, whatever the length of my inspiratory time is. So that's why it looks like a decelerating. The patient can pull more flow if they need to. However, they can still be air hungry and pressure control, even with the variable flow right there. But uh, that's something that we can take on a case by case. But here you see the beginning of inspiration change, right? Here we have a constant flow rate set in, over here with the square waveform. And then here it's a variable flow that the patient can pull through there. So something to look at when you're doing this. So inspiration is above the line, exhalation is below the line. So this part here would be your peak expiratory flow rate that I'm circling peak expiratory flow rate. So the further down it goes, the faster they can breathe out. The more shallow it is, the more slower their exhalation is. Uh, and then you can also see, okay, how long does it take them to exhale? And do they come out to baseline? If they don't come back to this baseline here that I just circled, if they don't come back to baseline, then that's a sign that they could be air trapping before the next breath is delivered. If the next breath is delivered and they don't come back to that baseline, that's a tra trapping gas in their lungs, right? And here's a good picture of that air trapping. Uh, so if the expiratory portion of the waveform doesn't return to baseline before the start of the next breath, there would be air trapping. So here you see this dotted line, right? Here you see the dotted line on the picture. Uh, that dotted line is going back up to baseline. It's saying, hey, what if they don't follow that dotted line? So look at the solid line. See how the solid line goes? And then the next breath is delivered and we're still below that baseline. 
That means they didn't exhale completely. There was still some gas that needed to come out, but just wasn't coming out. And so therefore that next breath was delivered. And now there's a bunch of gas that's still trapped in there that we didn't get out with that last breath. So can that be pretty significant? Yes. Remember above five, five above their baseline setting. Uh, so things that could cause this, what causes air trapping? Well, there could be a number of things, but some basic ones here include emphysema, right? Their lung pathology, right? Floppy, stretched out, low elastic lungs, right? <gasps> Big floppy, stretched out, low elastic lungs. Sure, it's going to take them a long, slow time constant to exhale, right? They have slow lung units. Uh, other things like inappropriate I to E ratio, most ventilators, I had talked about this on my alarm presentation, most ventilators will alarm when you get to an inappropriate I to E ratio. So let's say you're setting a one to one I to E ratio, right? And so what happens is that patient could be breathing so fast that they don't have enough time to exhale, right? So that could be inappropriate I to E ratio that you have based upon your vent settings as well. So what if they do have some air trapping and your I to E ratio is really uh, one to one or one to two? Well, maybe we need to get it to one to three. So we need to either increase inspiratory flow rate, uh, decrease eye time by uh, some reason, some way or another, or increase eye time by some way or another, or one of my favorite options, drop the rate so that way you have a longer time to exhale and you still have a long inspiratory time constant that's beneficial for that lung pathology. So what about bronchodilator response? And here's a good graphic showing you this. If we give a bronchodilator therapy, uh, you should see an increase in the peak flow rate. Here you see a very shallow peak inspiratory flow rate. And then here you see it move down, right, this next. So we gave them a bronchodilator. Pretend these aren't one breath after the other. Let's say it's been 10 minutes since their bronchodilator started, so they had time to kick in. Um, but now you see it's a lot deeper. It goes down further, and that's a sign of a higher peak expiratory flow rate, which is good, right? That means that we have better flows, which means better gas movement into and out of the respiratory zone, so better ventilation overall. The other thing that you see here is returning to baseline sooner. So here we have a long expiratory time, but now when we move over here, much shorter expiratory time, right, to get back to baseline. How fast does it come back to baseline? If it comes back a lot faster, that means the lungs are not nearly as slow as they used to be. You took care of that obstruction uh, in their airways, just like traffic, right? Everybody loves it when I bring up traffic, I know. Uh, but what happens when they remove an obstruction from the, air, from the roadway, right? Traffic moves faster, right? Traffic moves faster when they remove that obstruction. So that's what you're seeing here is that bronchodilator not only helped them exhale faster, but when they exhale faster, they're able to uh, go past that obstruction or form obstruction a lot easier. So it should relieve some of that worker breathing. So a uh, graphic can really see if they're responsive or not to bronchodilator therapy. And that's just the flow time scale. Well, wait till we get to the flow volume loop, right? The one that we use for PFTs. Hey, that one can help tell us about bronchodilator response also. Just saying. All right, question. This flow pattern indicates what is going on. All right, pause it, take some time to look at it. All right, so this pattern is indicating that we're not coming back up to baseline. Do you see how it's below baseline when that next breath is started? Well, that's a sign. <gasps> We trap some gas, right? It's a sign that this is auto peep or intrinsic peep, right? We have slow lung units compared to what's going on here. So what's the fix? We could try bronchodilators if they're wheezing, if they're a known uh, pulmonary patient, right? We can try bronchodilators and see if that's a thing. Or we can try changing our respiratory rate down to allow for more expiratory time. We can try decreasing our inspiratory time by increasing flow rate or just decreasing the numerical value if we're in a pressure targeted or pressure regulated mode, right? So we can try those things as well to help with our I to E ratio and see if that works. So those, those are some causes and some potential fixes for what you see here. All right. To assess improvement after breathing treatment, you should see what pre and post bronchodilator? The answer here is a shorter expiratory time 
in an improved peak expiratory flow rate. And that's what you see in this graphic here. So I love showing this to you. Hopefully this is something that you'll pay attention to out there when you're practicing. You can uh, Most ventilators will let you save uh, the graphics in one area, and then you can compare after an intervention of some sort, like a bronchodilator or a lung recruitment maneuver or a peak change, and so on and so forth. You can usually save a, a graphic at a certain point in time and then compare it after the procedure and see what's going on there. So here you see a better peak expiratory flow rate in a shorter expiratory time. So now we have faster lung units and much, much better flow of gas through the lungs. Right, so now we're looking in pressure limited controlled modes or time cycled. Um, when we're looking at this, the inspiratory flow should always return back to baseline, always return. But when we switch them over to pressure support modes, right? These are flow cycles. So we switch them over to wean. Another way of saying this, we switch them into a pressure support ventilation. Uh, we switch them over to a wean mode, a spontaneous mode, if you will. Flow does not return back to baseline. That's perfectly normal. Here you see in a pressure support mode, see this flow not returning back to baseline, right? Before the breath is exhaled, right? Here in this controlled mode, it does go back to baseline. So you're comparing these two to each other, right? You're comparing these two to each other. So here we have pressure support. Here we have a regular pressure control, right? So now you see if that flow doesn't return back to baseline, it's a sign they actually was a spontaneous breath. So they could be in spontaneous mode or they could be in SIMV, something like that could be going on or an IMV mode, right? SIMV is IMV mode. All right. The area of no flow is known as zero flow straight state. And you see that here in the graphic and it's already circle free, so I don't need to draw all over the screen. You're like, Derek, stop drawing all over my screen. Um, so this is indicative of an inspiratory time that is too long. Sounds like a test question. It's indicative of an inspiratory time that's too long for the patient. So you might actually need to decrease your eye time because it's so long. <gasps> It created a zero flow state. So that could be causing patient asynchrony as well. So that might be a sign you ha might have to decrease the inspiratory time. So this is a sign that it could be too long, too long for that patient. All right, what mode are we looking at? Is it volume or pressure control mode? Uh, is it a control rate or, or support mode? So when we're looking at this, the pressure waveform has a plateau. The pressure waveform has a plateau. The flow rate does not return to baseline. The flow rate does not return to baseline. So notice it's not the expiratory flow rate, it's the inspiratory flow rate that does not return to baseline. So what we're looking at here is actually pressure support mode pressure support mode right so here you see it's delivering a set pressure so hence the plateaus right uh, and the pressures are even throughout the whole thing and then you also see that flow rate not reaching inspiratory flow rate not reaching baseline not expiratory flow rate but inspiratory flow rate those are circled right there right inspiratory flow rate is not reaching baseline so that's what tells me this is a pressure support mode right pressure support mode Ooh, I love these. Uh, so the pressure volume loop. Uh, so we're getting into loops. Uh, this one is one of my favorites. And here you see what's called the dynamic elas elastic line. Uh, this is this individual dotted line here, right? That's running down that whole thing. Uh, and it's looking at elastins. It's, lo it's a way to look at compliance. Wherever the tip of this football up here goes is telling us about compliance. If this decides it wants to move down, then we have a lower compliance. If for some reason it moves back up, then our compliance is improving. So wherever that's going, it tells us what's happening with compliance. So I could look from the window of the nurse's station and see in there, if I have really good eyes, I could see, hey, that patient, uh, their compliance is going down, or hey, their compliance is getting better after those diuretics have kicked in, right? All those things could be happening. So 
we can see their compliance in there. The other thing that we can see in here, which we'll talk about in more detail, is their airway resistance. And that's going to be the hysteresis. That's going to be the distance here across that. So the bigger the distance, the fatter the loop, it's called a hysteresis. That's a sign of airway resistance, right? So if it becomes skinnier after a bronchodilator, then that's a sign we have less airway resistance and therefore it's easier for gas to flow through there. So I just with this one waveform, not only can I see how much pressure it takes to deliver the breath and how much volume they're getting, so whether they're in pressure mode or volume mode, it's going to be helpful. I can also see what's happening to their compliance at the same time and I can see what's happening with the air resistance at the same time with one mode and it'll even show other things like worker breathing, uh, leaks, all those other things will still be in here. Awesome, right? So hopefully I've sold you a little bit on the PV loop. It's going to be one of our friends. We can even see if there's over distension on this as well. So the volume is on the Y axis. That's the vertical axis. Uh, the pressure is going to be on the horizontal axis. Uh, inspiratory curve is going to go upward. And then expiratory curve is going to go back down again. Uh, so that's how that normally goes. Spontaneous breaths will usually go clockwise. Spontaneous breaths will usually go clockwise. Uh, positive pressure breaths go counterclockwise. So it's telling you which mode the patient's in as well there. The bottom of the loop is usually going to be at the set peep level. And then if imaginary line is drawn down the middle of the loop, that's what I was pointing out just a minute ago. The area right uh, to the right represents inspiratory resistance and the area to the left re represents expiratory resistance. So if I see hysteresis and it's mostly on the expiratory side, maybe I have an HME that's blocked up. Maybe I have an expiratory filter, which is more likely expiratory filter, or there's water in the expiratory side of the circuit that's making a high resistance to gas flowing out. So that could be what's causing that there. If it's on the inspiratory side, are they biting on the tube? Is there secretions in the tube? Is there something like that going on? Bronchospasm, you name it. All right, the flow volume loop, oh, sorry, pressure volume loop can be used to look at over distension, which I have some examples in here. Any type of airway obstructions, right? We talked about uh, inspiratory versus expiratory with the, with the hysteresis of the loop. Uh, bronchodilator response, because the air resistance should change, right? So therefore you could see a slimmer loop there. A respiratory mechanics, compliance and air resistance, we've already talked about that. Work of breathing, I have a little slide that shows that. If they're air hungry, also known as flow starvation, right? We can see that on there too. If there's any leaks where it's not coming back to baseline, or even triggering effort, right? It gives us a whole bunch of information. And I like that this one includes raw and compliance with it. All right, so here are some graphics, right? Here's some pictures. So at the top here, we talked about this just a little bit ago, that that top part represents dynamic compliance, right? So dynamic compliance is a change in volume over the change in pressure basic, right? Change in volume or change in pressure. So as the dynamic compliance changes, so will the tip of this waveform. Like I said, if the dynamic compliance decreases, in other words, it's harder to expand the chest wall for some reason or another. Let's say it's a massive pleural fusion. Well, it's going to fall down. It's going to start falling down like a lemon just laying on its side. It's going to fall down, right? But if it becomes more vertical, like a lemon standing on its uh, head right there, then it's going to be a sign that the dynamic compliance is improving, right? Hey, you got rid of that pleural fusion. Guess what's happening? It's coming up, right? It's coming up. It's raising up. So it's going to be very helpful when we're looking at that dynamic compliance portion. Uh, it can change shape. Uh, because it, you're looking at a limit or a constant, especially if you're in pressure control. Uh, so here's just a sign, hey, we're in a pressure controlled mode. So pressure's on this x-axis down here, not time, right? Pressure's down here. So if we're in a pressure of, uh, let's just say this is 20, right? A pressure of 20 here. So once we hit that pressure of 20, the breath is delivered. And then here's our tidal volume up here. And then now they're exhaling, right? So you'll see it change also with the mode. So when you're in lab, put this on your little list that I'm encouraging to make. Things I want to look at when I look at waveforms, uh, pressure control versus volume control in the PV loop, right? Pressure control versus volume control in the PV loop. And see if you can spot this, right? See if you can spot that.
All right, one of my favorite ones, this was on the boards all the time. Uh, this is what we call beaking, all right? So pressure continues to increase with little or no change in volume, creates a little bird beak, right? Here's a little bird beak thing there. So how do we fix this? What's the fix? Do you see this? That means there's alveolar over distension or over distension or too much pressure with no volume change that could be barrow trauma right pressure high pressure for no volume change that could be barrow trauma and or uh or um volume trauma so when we're looking at this we know it's barrow trauma so how do we fix this reducing the tidal volume is going to be the big thing when you see this beaking all right we talked about air resistance so here is the slide that's looking at it as the air resistance goes up the loop will become wider this is known as a hysteresis right Here's your fancy word. If you're like, how do I spell that? There it is, hysteresis. So if it's inspiratory resistance, right, it gets much bigger here, and that's why you see it coming out here. Uh, inspiratory resistance, if there's a kink in the tube, the patient's biting the tube, if there's secretions in the tube, anything like that, right, it's blocking that ability for gas to flow in there. Uh, if it's on the expiratory side over here, could be secretions, uh, bronchospasm uh, especially. And then also look at the expiratory filter. Sometimes those get pretty gunked up, especially if you've been nebulizing things through the circuit. So make sure you check those as well. Ooh, what do we have here? So this is, I like this slide a lot. I like the PV loop a lot, obviously. Uh, so here you see a bunch of different things going on. Here we have, I'm gonna circle it here. So if you're just listening, make sure you, you take a peek at the screen at some point here. I circled it. This is the fishtail. I like looking at this fishtail. Uh, it's an adequately sensitive trigger forces the patient to work hard, generating a large negative pressure. In other words, your sensitivity is not appropriate. So the patient's working hard to pull that breath in, right? So if you see that fishtail, that's a high work of breathing. You're causing a work of breathing with your machine. You're not supposed to be doing that. First, do no harm, right? So that means your, your trigger is not sensitive enough. So you might want to make your trigger more sensitive to that patient. The next one that we see here is the patient tries to initiate an inspiration by creating negative pressure. So here it would be the patient trying to trigger the breath. So that's their trigger where it actually hit, kicks in. And you see that it's scooped out here. See how it's scooped out? And that's where we get this little box here saying, hey, a scooped out inspiratory curve on this thing usually means they're air hungry or flow starving, right? So that means they're trying to generate a higher inspiratory flow rate than what the machine's giving them. So if they're in pressure control, increase their pressure. If they're in volume control, increase their flow rate, right? They're air hungry, they're air hungry, right? So give them some air, right? Give them some flow rate. How do we increase flow rate and pressure control? You increase pressure, right? How do you increase flow rate and volume control? You increase flow rate. <laughs> Uh, pretty straightforward there, right? Uh, so you see that there. So if you see it sucked into the negative side, right? See how it's sucked in? Uh, that's a sign uh, that that could be air hungry, right? So we need to fix that. Um, here we see a little beak here, right? The patient is trying to exhale against the closed expiratory valve. In other words, the breath hasn't been delivered up here it would be the end of breath delivery up here where I just drew that arrow. Right here would be end of breath delivery, but the, the breath hasn't been 100% delivered yet. So the patient's trying to blow out against it. So that's positive pressure. So that's why it's on this waveform as a positive deflection, right? See how if the air hunger goes as a negative deflection. And then if it's a positive deflection, that patient's trying to blow out against it. So you're looking at this patient, you're like, Derek, what does this look like? If you look at a patient lying in semi fowlers position on a ventilator and you see them using their abdominal muscles, you see them forcefully blowing against the ventilator before the breath has been delivered. That's what you would see here is this little thing there before the breath has been fully delivered. So that's where we would change the expiratory sensitivity. You could change their eye time. Yes, there is expiratory sensitivity. I do encourage you to play with that in the lab as well, but uh, you can change their eye time as well. Maybe the eye time is too long and there's a zero flow state, right? Maybe something like that's going on. 
And then uh, when we're seeing this, hopefully this sort of helps you understand, okay, this is what's going on with this patient, right? We see that positive deflection. They're, I look at them and they're forcing the breath out against it. We need to make some changes. Or, hey, I see this negative deflection. They're air hungry. Is there something I can do on my end with the machine to help them be more comfortable and get rid of any work of breathing that they're they're doing yeah absolutely right that's what we're there for so you see these graphics recognizing these patterns is going to be very helpful in making sure your patients are more comfortable so we don't have to over sedate them so we don't have to use more aggressive measures that could potentially cause harm and have been shown to cause harm in long-term situations all right, so here are your basic examples of things that would cause increased compliance. So here you see how the tip of the, the, the PV curve has gone up, right? It's like a lemon laying on its top, right? And so therefore, it, things like that with emphysema or if you gave surfactant to a baby, sure enough, their dynamic compliance can change. Or let's say you drained a massive pleural fusion, right? That's not on that list. But anything like that that does that can change it or let's say you have a patient that was um, lying full supine and they're significantly obese morbidly obese and then you put them to semi fallers right you could see a compliance change a dynamic compliance change now that that weight is off of their chest wall so that you you could see these changes with something like that as well uh, with decreased compliance which is the second one over here uh, an example, the big one here is ARDS or more atelectasis, right? So they're having a lot less uh, higher pressures for that lower volume. So you see it just moving down. So this is a good pattern to watch. I always liked saving the first loop of the day when I see my patient the first part of the morning. And then every time after that, I would compare the loop to the first loop of the day. So then I could sort of see that trending. Yes, you could trend the numbers and they're gonna be accurate and gonna be more sensitive to this, but it's always good to see what's happening as an overall trend too. And I think it's good to show other people that or to point out, hey, this is where their loop is currently. And then this loop that's behind there, like the, what the servo I does, the servo does, uh, that loop behind there represents where they were at earlier today. So you could sort of see uh, how they progress throughout the day, whether they've gotten worse or better with their situation. All right, if the expiratory portion of the loop does not return to baseline, this indicates there's a leak, right? And here you see the leak, right? Not returning to baseline. So this could be a leak in the cuff, it could be a chest tube, it could be any number of things. Uh, it could be that the endotracheal tube is slightly extubated, right? Just above the vocal cords hanging out in there. So anything like that could be causing this waveform. So it's a good one to look at as well. All right, so the inflection points. There's, there's a lower and upper inflection points, right? Uh, and then there is the third inflection point, which tells you about dynamic compliance. And your book does talk more about this. The lower inflection point represents the point of alveolar recruitment so that's this one down here how much pressure it took to recruit or open up the alveoli uh, so that's one of the things that you might see when people are trying to do optimal peep trials there's a bunch of different ways to do optimal peep trials however one of them involves looking at your graphics uh, and some people try to use the inflection points as their their standard of, of optimal peep uh, so when they do this the, some lung protection strategies for treating ARDS suggest setting the PEEP just above the lower inflection point to help uh, keep those alveoli open and to keep recruitment. So that's one way of doing optimal PEEP trials. Other ones look at blood gases or they look at compliance with different PEEP levels. Some include both, some include all three, right? So there's a bunch of different ones there. This isn't that class, right? The graphics presentation isn't the auto PEEP or the optimal PEEP presentation that's a whole separate subject all right question what does this loop indicate right what is going on with this picture right here we see it falling down like a lemon on its side or a football on its side right that's a sign uh, our compliance is going downhill right we see this with your ARDS type patients anything that's causing restrictive effect right any restrictive pattern any restrictive pattern that's shown up, including pleural fusions, including uh, anything with the lung and chest wall, abdomen and ileus, things like that, blood in the abdomen that's pushing up, uh, anything like that could be causing this, right? So it's a sh sign of decreased 
uh, compliance or a sign of restrictive effect that's going on. All right, what is occurring when this bird beak is an appearance, right? When we see an appearance of the bird beak, that usually means we're over distended or we're causing barotrauma, right? Because we have an increase in pressure with no change in volume. So that's a sign that could be too much pressure. So how do we fix that if they're in volume control? Turn down the volume, right? If they're in pressure control, turn down the pressure, right? So that's what we're looking at here. Traditionally, if you, you see this on the board exams, they're going to ask you to turn down the tidal volume, right? Because it's too much. All right, lung protection strategy suggests setting the PEEP at what point? Upper inflection point, lower inflection point, or the third inflection point? Right, hopefully you all said the lower inflection point. That's what they want you to know. Um, there are some other schools of thought out there, but we don't have time for that here, right? We can always get into that in class. All right, one of my favorite ones here, especially since it's PFT world, this is gonna be your flow volume loop, flow volume loop. So we just finished pressure volume, now we're in flow volume. So if you're writing notes, switch it over to flow volume, right, flow volume loop. Um, so your volume is gonna be on your X axis, and your flow is on your vertical axis. That's what we're looking at here. So anything above this line is going to give you inspiratory flow rate anything below is going to give you expiratory flow rate so yes it is opposite of the pft where it's flipped around where you blow into it and the inspiratory portion portion is on the bottom right because you you exhale into it and then once you're all the way exhaled you breathe in right here it's upside down but it's still the same information that you're looking at. Here we see the inspiratory flow rate, so peak inspiratory flow rate, and then here you see the expiratory flow rate. So just like someone with COPD emphysema, you're still gonna see scooping, right, that happens with this as well. So it gives you a lot of valuable data, especially with your obstructive pattern patients. So you put someone that has an obstructive pattern on a ventilator, this could be a very valuable loop to look at. So flow is on the y-axis or the vertical axis. The volume is on the x-axis, the horizontal one. The flow volume loop is the same as the one on the PFT, but it's upside down. Inspiration is above the horizontal line. Exhalation is below. The shape of the inspiratory portion of the curve will match the flow waveform. So if you go back to that previous one, you'll see that it's a square, right? So it's telling you, hey, that's a square waveform, right? So therefore, you can even see it when you're looking at that. So a square waveform, they're probably in volume ventilation there, right? Kind of cool to look at that. So the, the shape of the expiratory flow curve represents passive exhalation. So that's one of the big things that we're using this for is not usually for inspiratory flow rates, but for expiratory flow rates. With obstructive diseases, that's the big one to look at is that expiratory flow rate. So when we're looking at this, uh, we can look at peak inspiratory flow rate from the ventilator, but really peak expiratory flow rate, and even tidal volume if they're in spontaneous mode or pressure support mode, uh, that tidal volume could be something we can trend there as well. And it does look circular, like a circle with spontaneous breathing. And if you get to see little babies in the NICU and play with those ventilators, don't play with the ventilators, but if you get to see the different graphics uh, there, uh, try looking at there, it's gonna look like a bunch of little circles. It's adorable. All right, so what is this used to assess? A lot of cool stuff here. Like these machines aren't just for delivering a breath and calling it good. When we're looking at modern day mechanical ventilation, it's all about not only delivering a breath and making sure we get good data, but also these machines are becoming more and more diagnostically capable. We can see more diagnostics, including doing things like the flow volume loop, right? Uh, pressure volume curve, right? All those things are going to tell us about uh, diagnostics, where this patient's trending, where they're going, and not just about delivering a breath and calling it good, right? We're well past the days where this is just an electronic Ambu bag, well past those days. So when we're looking at the flow volume loop, it can be looking for air trapping. I'll give you some examples there. Airway obstruction, like I said, for those obstructive patterns, right? You're a C-babe, CF, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, asthma, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, right? For your obstructive processes, even if it's a foreign body process where they're on the ventilator, anything that's an obstructive pattern, uh, this can be very helpful in those patients, right?
We can see what's going on with their airway resistance. We can see if they're responding to bronchodilators. We can see what their expiratory flow rates are. We can see if they're air hungry. We can see if there's leaks. If there's water or secretions accumulating, which is changing their airway resistance. And if there is dyssynchrony as well or asynchrony as well. So this is a very valuable loop to look at. And of course, I'm going to be biased because of my PFT background. Mm -hmm. All right, here is a more annotated picture. Here you see inspiration begins down here at the baseline there. And then as it goes, it gets going in a clockwise pattern, right? So inspiration is. So this is what type of flow delivery? Looks awfully square, right? So this is probably volume mode uh, square. Uh, so here the inspiration is up here. And now they begin exhalation here at this baseline. So now they're exhaling. And now we hit the place where it's their peak expiratory flow rate. So peak expiratory flow rate. So if they're doing a bronchodilator response, I should see it go down further, right? If they're responding positively to that bronchodilator. If their asthma is getting worse, if their bronchospasm is getting worse, then this is going to move up, right? If they're not going to exhale as fast. Right, so that's something that you would see there. So that's their peak flow rate, and then this is that passive part of their exhalation. That's the, roughly your 25 to 75 uh, peak expiratory flow rate, 25 to 75 percent there. All right, remember before I was saying the shape of the inspiratory portion will match the flow waveform. So hey. On your little sheet that I'm encouraging you to write when you go into the lab is try looking at your flow volume loop right try looking at your flow volume loop and changing it between square and decelerating ramp and see what happens right you should see somewhat of a change now these are meant to represent drastic changes but you should see some change here right so that shapes should tell you be able to tell you if it's matching or not right so here you see that constant pattern right and so that would be a flow rate of 60 liters per minute it's just set set it and forget it type thing but over here, right, when you're looking at this one, you're seeing that variable or that decelerating ramp flow rate. And so that's why it's delivered and it's petering off and it's before time's over. All right. Now, exhalation begins. All right. This is what it looks like if it does not return back to baseline, right? Here it's showing what does it do if it doesn't turn back to baseline. So the dotted line here is showing baseline it's going back to baseline but the solid line says hey this patient's not going back to normal they're not going back to baseline right they're not going back to baseline so therefore there's a leak uh, could be a cuff leak could be um, tube is too high could be a, a chest tube leak could be uh, someone left the suction ballard open right things like that could happen right all right, here we go. This is turned right side up, right, uh, the, uh, on a PFT view, right? So we're looking at PFT world here. So maybe this is giving you anxiety because you're like, I didn't like PFTs. Anyway, the expiratory part of the curve will still scoop whether it's right side up or upside down, right? The expiratory portion, portion will still scoop. Uh, and that's showing small airway obstruction. So that means their expiratory resistance is pretty high. So asthma, emphysema would be your big ones in this category. Asthma, emphysema would be your big ones here. So if I have someone with asthma or emphysema on mechanical ventilation and their primary thing is that disease process, then this would be a valuable waveform, right? Because then I can see if their scooping is getting better, getting worse, what's happening with their peak flow rate, right? I can look at all those from breath to breath and from minute to minute. And even like I said, with some of these ventilators, you can save that loop as a reference loop. And then you can see what happens over the course of 20 minutes, over the course of two hours, over the course of four hours, so on and so forth. So here is showing the same thing, but uh, what the ventilator gives you, right? Where they're scooping there, right? It's just showing it upside down, right? So same thing that you were looking at before, this is still inspiratory, this is still expiratory, right? So you're still gonna see that scooping waveform and that reduced peak flow. Look at how much peak flow there is over here and look at how much it goes down over there, right? So that's a bad sign that they're not able to exhale near as fast. Right, so when we're looking at this, this is the, the flow volume loop, uh, right, that we're looking at here. So it can really tell us where inspiration begins, where inspiration ends, uh, and it tells us ultimately what's going on, how much volume is being delivered. So if we have someone in a pressure control mode, 
then that we can look at how much volume is delivered from breath to breath to breath. Because remember, in pressure control mode, volume varies. And so we can see if their compliance is changing. If their compliance is decreasing, right, they're getting stiffer and stiffer lungs or chest wall, right, something's going on right then we'd see their volumes get smaller and smaller and smaller if their compliance starts improving let's say we got rid of a pleural fusion right it's starting to drain it's starting to drain right we can see it widen up if they're in pressure ventilation right because their volumes should improve so that's another valuable thing that we can look at here um, besides just looking at flow rates and airway obstruction we can still see especially if they're in pressure control what happens to their compliance all right, when the expiratory side of the loop doesn't return to baseline, what's most likely going on? You should be like, Derek, that's a leak all day long, right? There you go. There's a leak. All right, what is the term used for this part that's indicated by the arrow? This is called scooping, right? Scooping, so that's your the, that expiratory flow rate, 25 to 75%. Uh, so that's that scooping you see with obstructive diseases, traditionally uh, emphysema and asthma would be your two primary culprits for this scenario. All right, so what are some causes, right? Uh, insufficient expiratory time, uh, early collapse or unstable alveoli during exhalation can easily be some causes that we see going on here. Uh, we need to uh, identify it on the graphic. So the pressure waveform, uh, while performing an expiratory hold, if the pressure waveform rises above baseline, then that means we have uh, auto peep uh, with flow rate, uh, with our flow waveform, the expiratory flow does not return back to baseline. That's a sign of air trapping. In the volume scalar, right, the expiratory portion will not return to baseline. In the flow volume loop, the loop does not meet at the baseline. In the pressure volume loop, the loop does not meet at baseline. So do you see this pattern here? So how do we fix this, right? If uh, they're air trapping, uh, we need to give them a treatment if it's indicated for a bronchodilator. Uh, we might need to adjust their inspiratory time by increasing flow rate if it's an inappropriate IDE ratio thing or adding PEEP um, or decreasing rate to allow for longer expiratory time. Uh, so those are all fixes that we can do when we have air trapping. Uh, so if you have insufficient expiratory time, uh, then that's, those are some of our fixes as well as how you would identify it on the graphics. All right, so causes when we're looking at this, bronchospasm, ET2 problems, if it's too small or kinked or obstructed, um, if the patient's biting, high flow rates are another thing that we have to worry about here. Secretions build up, uh, damped or blocked expiratory filter. I've seen that so many times and it's one of the last things you end up doing uh, is changing out the expiratory filter and sometimes that was the easiest first thing that could have been done as well. Uh, water in the HME, if you're using an HME, right? Uh, how do you identify in the graphics? Uh, if the PIP increases but the plateau stays the same, that's a sign of high br uh, bronchospasm or an ET2 problem. So these are causes. Uh, this is how you identify these causes, and these are how you fix these causes, right? So if the pressure goes up but the plateau stays the same, it's a raw relationship. If the flow waveform, the flow scalar, it takes longer for the expiratory side to go back up to baseline. Uh, the expiratory flow rate, peak expiratory flow rate, is a lot shorter, right? A lot shorter. Uh, the volume scalar, it takes longer for the curve to reach the baseline, right? Slow lung units because raw is increased. The PV loop, the loop will be wider, right? That's called hysteresis. Uh, and the means you have an increase in inspiratory resistance, which will cause the bulge to the right. If it's expiratory resistance, bulge to the left. So I know I, I got to change out the expiratory filter if I see it on the expiratory side, or you know if that's it is what the cause is. If the flow volume loop, the decreased expiratory flow rate or a scoop in the expiratory curve usually means one of these things is going on. So how do I fix it? Give a treatment, suction, change the tube if the tube's an issue, uh, add a bite block, right? So on and so forth. All right, so decreased compliance. What are some causes for a lower compliance? Of course, ARDS, right? It's a syndrome. A lot of different things can cause it. Uh, atelectasis, uh, especially patients that have uh, issues where we're having to use lower tidal volumes. Uh, if they do have an ARDS, they're going to have atelectasis. Patients that um, 
are p not breathing deeply for some reason or another. Uh, it could be a body habitus thing, uh, abdominal distension, like an ileus or uh, blood in the abdomen, high abdominal pressure of any sort. Uh, congestive heart failure can decrease compliance because of pulmonary edema. Consolidation with inflammation, right? You're inflaming the respiratory zone and it won't allow it to expand. Pulmonary fibrosis, of course, stick uh, thick uh, lungs, right? So you're, you're going to make it really hard for them to move and to expand hyperinflation. If you're using too much PEEP, if you're using too much tidal volume, right, that would be your thing there. And then finally, a pneumothorax or pleural fusions could really easily decrease compliance right away. If you walk into a room and their peak pressure is 40 and the plateau pressure is 40, they're both high and equal, uh, check for a pneumo. Just word to the wise. Uh, things that causes increased compliance, well, two big ones here would be uh, someone with the emphysema process because their lung pathology is naturally big and floppy, so they can expand very easily without taking much pressure at all. And finally, uh, surfactant replacement therapy for your neonate population, right? That could change that compliance pretty easily as well. Uh, other things that could increase compliance but not cause the compliance value to be above normal would be things like surfactant replacement uh, beyond surfactant replacement there would be like relieving someone of a pleural effusion, relieving someone of a pneumothorax, relieving someone of hyperinflation, relieving someone of their congestive heart failure uh, pulmonary edema, relieving someone of their abdominal distension, relieving someone of their atelectasis, right? Do you see that pattern, right? Those ones will help improve compliance back to closer to normal. So how do you identify these on the graphics? Well, here you go, right? Pressure waveform, the PIP and PLAT both increase, right? That's what we have there. Or the pressure volume loop, it lays more horizontal, like a lemon laying on its side. That would be a sign that their compliance is going down. Compliance is going down. How do you identify on the graphics if it's increased compliance? Well, the PIP and PLAT will both decrease. Hey, those both those numbers are going down. That's a good sign. Or the pressure volume loop will become more vertical it's going to rise up right and so that's going to be a sign uh hey that's uh an improvement there all right what about leaks uh chest tube leak fistulas ng tubes in the trachea i've seen that one uh inspiratory leak loose connections ventilator malfunctions faulty flow sensors right those things can happen so how do you identify it how do you look see it uh you can look at the pressure scaler so if the pip is low uh that could be a sign there's a leak we talked about some of this in the alarms uh presentation the volume waveform that the expiratory side doesn't go back down to baseline uh if the peak expiratory flow is decreased if the the PV loop uh, doesn't return back to baseline. If the flow volume loop doesn't return back to baseline, hopefully you see a pattern here, right? How do we fix it? Check for the possible causes, right? Is the ET tube cuff up, right? Uh, what's the pressure? Uh, is there a chest tube present? Uh, is there an, a recently placed NG tube that may not be in the gastric? Um, right? Uh, is there any loose connections, right? Uh, so do a leak test to make sure all the connections are tight. Uh, so that where you would take them off and you would bag them and then you just do a short self-test, uh, that startup procedure there to make sure it's not the machine. All right, what about flow rate or triggering, right? Air hunger, uh, neurological injury patients tend to have this uh, improperly set sensitivity. That could be your fault, but uh, you gotta customize it to your patients. Well, how do you identify these things are going on? Well, in the pressure scaler, the patient tries to inhale and exhale in the middle of the waveform. So you're gonna see a dip in pressure. So you're gonna see, here's the pressure being delivered and you see a dip and then there's exhalation, this negative deflection there in that middle, that's a sign, <gasps> air hunger, right? The patient's pulling negative pressure. So their pressure scaler, you can see air hunger there. We talked about in the PV loop where it looks like it's sucked in, right? So here I have my PV loop and you see it being sucked in, right? This little negative deflection there that we're looking at, that's, that's one of those big causes that we're seeing of, hey, that's a sign, they're air hungry, right? So any negative pressure deflection could be a sign of air hunger. Um, PV loop, the patient, oh yeah, uh, inspiratory or expiratory. Uh, the flow volume loop, the patient makes an effort to breathe and it dips uh, as well. So you can see it in that waveform. How do we fix air hunger, right? We can increase flow rate if we're in volume control. Um, 
we can decrease eye time, which means they should get more of that breath, or increasing the set rate to capture the patient if they're air hungry or they need more a minute ventilation. Uh, we can try changing the mode, sometimes from a partial to a full support, if that's such a thing, uh, going off your patient. If it's neurologic, we may have to go with sedation or paralytics. Not our first choice, obviously. Uh, adjusting sensitivity for sure if they're having issues there um, but one of the big things here is just trying to change that so if they're in pressure control then we need to increase pressure is another way if they're air hungry if they're in volume control increasing the flow rate if they're air hungry uh, if they're in dual control we can go ahead and uh, increase their inspiratory time as well sorry or decrease their inspiratory time as well so flow starvation, this is what you're seeing here uh, on this patient. You see how it's getting sucked in, right, on that pressure time scaler. So this is a pressure time scaler, so it's that negative deflection. And here's what it looks like there, right? You see it sucked in compared to the one over here where there's no sucking in, right? So you see the patient pulling in, and then the next breath, the patient's just letting it deliver the breath. So there's a sign of air hunger or flow starvation. So how are you going to fix it, right? It depends what mode you're in. Right, here's what the air hunger looks like in the different waveforms. Here's your inspiratory, right? You see that negative deflection. Your inspiratory on your PV loop, negative deflection. Are you seeing a pattern here? If it's a negative deflection with breath delivery, that's air hunger. All right, the inspiratory rise time determines the amount of time it takes to reach the desired airway pressure, right, uh, of the peak flow rate. So that's what we're looking at here is the rise time. So this is something I want you to put on your little piece of paper that you uh, are trying to look at in the lab, right, things to observe, is play with the rise time percent. So this is something you'll see in pressure modes. Uh, it's used to assess if the, if the ventilator is meeting the patient's demand in pressure support mode. So we can see it here, if it's meeting or not meeting. So here we have a breath being too fast and it causes a little tooth up here. Do you see that, right? You see that little tooth up there? If it's too slow, you're gonna see it just has this slow ramp there. That's not normal, that's not what we want. So that's too fast and too slow. So you want it somewhere in between these two, right? That's the whole point. So then you can adjust it appropriately for your patient, right? Uh, inspiration ends with your pressure and uh, if inspiration ends and your pressure is still flow is still above baseline a they could be in spontaneous mode right we talked about that uh, where it's just pressure support mode where it's flow cycled instead of time cycled right and that's something you could be seeing there all right when we're looking at this and this would be a flow cycled person uh, if they uh, the machine is set to cycle the inspiration off at 30% of the patient's peak uh, uh, peak inspiratory flow rate. That's what you're setting here. It won't cycle to exhalation until I reach that point there. If you set it for 75%, then it could cycle as soon as up there, right? Which for a patient that's really whoosh, forcing against it, maybe we need to change that expiratory sensitivity so it, it can cycle off earlier and earlier and earlier, right? That's something you might have to adjust when you're doing that uh, that expiratory sensitivity. So this is all about changing expiratory sensitivity to make it a lot more synchronous with that patient's effort. Uh, exhalation spike, that's what I wanted to show you here. Uh, letter A here showing you the cycle off percentage is too high. So what happens to their inspiratory time? It looks very, very short. It's set at 60%, right? So it's too soon, right? They're not getting enough tidal volume here, right? They're not getting near enough tidal volume in pressure support ventilation. So what's gonna happen? They're gonna hypoventilate. Are they gonna be able to wean to extubate? Uh, odds are no, they're not getting adequate minute ventilation. Over here, letter B, when we're looking at this one, we see an exhalation spike, right? And here they have it set at 10%. So that means nine, they have to wait till 90% of the flow has been delivered before they can cycle it to exhalation. That can cause a high level of work of breathing and the patient can look horrible, right? They're forcing out against the machine and they're working hard. That could fatigue them and make them spend a lot longer on the ventilator. So odds are we try to want it somewhere in the middle. So we're talking about pressure support ventilation here and our expiratory sensitivity. The lower the percentage, that means 
the longer it takes before the patient can cycle that off. The higher the percentage, that means the sooner they can cycle it off. So this is where you got to look at your patient. What's appropriate? Are they getting their tidal volumes? Yes or no. Uh, are you seeing something like an exhalation spike? Yes or no. So that should tell you which direction to go with it. All right, the red portion of this waveform is telling you that the eye time is, or the rise time is, right? This rise time is too slow, way too slow, right? It should not look like that, right? It should be a nice little square, right? It should be a nice little square. All right, this pressure support breath is set to cycle at 30% of the patient's flow rate, right? 30% of their peak flow rate. So this is where we have the patient set here, and that way they still have 70% of the breath that's been delivered or exhaled, 70% of the breath that's been, that flow rate's been exhaled, so then they can cycle off a lot sooner.